Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 through 22. I'm reading from the New International Version of Scripture. You'll find words recorded like these. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it's a boy, if it's a boy kill him, but if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. For these times, these moments that are mine, I would like to place a tag on verse 17. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. I want to talk today for just a few minutes about an uncompromised commitment. An uncompromised commitment. Whenever women appear in the scriptures, they are often the extras in the story. Sometimes they have supporting roles, but very rarely are they the stars. Like extras in a movie, they are the topic of discussion, but they are often in the background. This is because the stories of the Bible often reflect what theologian Lisa Wilson Davis calls a patriarchal, patrilineal, and patrilocal society. This means in practical and societal terms that the culture is dominated by men, that wives live with their husbands' families, and that land is passed down with the exception of the daughters of Zelophehad through male heirs. The larger implication is that in the biblical text, most of the primary concerns are male concerns. The storylines revolve around men. And even when women appear in the story, they are most often presented from a male's perspective. Thus, while holding the belief that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, it cannot be denied that the Bible is primarily a male production. This is not just true in, in the Bible, but it's true in society. In her book, Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg states, the blunt truth is men still run the world. Despite significant strides made by women over the years, women often lag behind their male counterparts in most arenas of leadership and certainly in compensation. James Brown put it this way, it's a man's world. That's why I'm particularly struck by this story of Shifra and Pua. Their story is found in the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, a book which is primarily dominated by male characters, men like Moses, Pharaoh, Aaron and Joshua. But ironically, there would be no exodus from Egypt without the actions of five women. Jochebed, Moses' mama. Miriam, Moses' sister. Bethia, Pharaoh's daughter, conspired to save the life of Moses, the future liberator. But before Moses' mother, before Miriam, and before Pharaoh's daughter, there were two midwives, Shifra and Pua. 
not household names. They were marginal and peripheral characters. They were not persons of influence or affluence. They had no impressive pedigree. They had no imperial political power. In fact, by most estimations, they were probably considered to be weak, impotent, and invisible. And yet, there would have been no exodus from Egypt had it not been for these two sisters. You see, Shifra and Pua had a decision to make. Their orders were very clear. All the baby boys from among the Hebrews had to die. Their orders were clear and succinct. Their orders were murder. Pharaoh had said so. We just read the text. Any boy born to a Hebrew mother was to be put to death right there on the birthing stool. Before a male child's life could be lost to genocide, Pharaoh attempted to enlist these women to commit infa infanticide. It is a defining moment in history. A change in the political structure has taken place, and a new administration that did not know Joseph or his brothers is in charge. This pharaoh has no commitment or loyalty to prior agreements made by the predecessor. He cares nothing about grain operation, grain save, that Joseph was instrumental in creating and administrating. Privileges granted by the previous administration no longer exist. They can't hang out in City Hall like they used to. They're no longer on first name basis with staff. They can't make phone calls or even go to lunch. Privileges have been forfeited or withdrawn. But nevertheless, this small favorite nation of Hebrews is poised for liberation. Although they are slaves, they have preferred status because they have been chosen by God to receive the promises of God. But this favored status makes them a threat to the empire. Although these people have done nothing wrong and there is no obvious indication of conspiracy, their growth in numbers causes fear, worry, and paranoia in the heart of the king. The threat of the loss of control causes him to speculate and make movies and imagine what life would be like, Lord help me here, if these Hebrew boys grow up to be strong and rise up against us. In reality, he anticipates a potential exodus of a cheap labor source. You know, when you really track the cable beneath a lot of this stuff, at the end of the day, money is always in it somewhere. And so out of his anxiety, he generates a fresh policy of forced labor. Whips were cracked. Commands were barked, with Hebrews bending over bricks for buildings and bending over fields for planting. Bent backs were intended to decrease the expanding number of Hebrews, but the plan backfired. Despite the forced labor, despite the unreasonable expectation to make bricks without straw, with low wages, no wages, no benefits, the Hebrews continue to multiply. It's an amazing thing how the thing that was intended to break you often makes you. It's an amazing thing how the very thing that was intended to take you out often gives you strength to overcome. The plan didn't work. The policy failed, but Pharaoh would not be defeated. He enlists the aid of Shifra and Pua, ordinary women, midwives, extras, in the larger scheme, in the background, midwives to be seen and not heard. It was their job to follow orders. It was their job to deliver babies. But Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, wanted them to kill the baby boys because he feared them. He did what most fearful and insecure leaders often do. He created policies to oppress them. And he created an enemy when there was really no enemy that existed. He stirred up his imagination and his paranoia and found himself creating policies to oppress the Hebrews when there was no need to oppress them. As we often observe in life, the oppressor fears the oppressed. Oppressors tend to fear the oppressed. 
from Selma to Memphis, from Ferguson to New York, from Libya to South Africa, from Israel to America, the oppressed tend to fear the oppressor tends to fear the oppressed. The question that is always on the mind of the oppressor is what will the oppressed do if they become too many and have access to power? What will the rich do if the poor keep asking for more? What will the women do if we release them and allow them to share in leadership? What will blacks do if we really give them the right to vote? What will immigrants do if we grant them the privilege of citizenship. The oppressor tends to fear the oppressed. Yeah. So Pharaoh issues an order and he says to the midwives, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. But the text says that the midwives feared God. The Hebrew word translates to mean they reverenced God. They had a holy respect for God. They respected God. They stood in awe of God. And because they reverenced God, they did not do as the king commanded them, but they let the boys live. The message translation says, but the midwives had far too much respect for God and didn't do what the king of Egypt ordered. In other words, in the final analysis, the midwives worked for God and not just Pharaoh. And when you work for God, there are certain things you just can't do. When you work for God, I say, there are certain things you just can't say. When you work for God, there are certain games you just can't play. Shifra and Pua didn't just work for Pharaoh, but they worked for God. And so in essence, they told Pharaoh no. They said no to evil. They chose liberation over capitalism. They sought vigilance over violence. They exercised discipline over destruction. And their action put them at great risk. Pharaoh was the most powerful man in the empire and had shown a willingness to kill whoever got in his way. This is Pharaoh we're talking about. Pharaoh could do whatever he wanted to do when he got ready to. Pharaoh built pyramids. He controlled the known world. He and Enslave people. He's the one that wrote the policy to enslave the, Egypt, the Hebrews. He was rich beyond imagination. Pharaoh was like a god. People bowed down to the king. They did what the king said. People feared the king of Egypt. Ah, but the midwives, they feared God. They had too much respect for God, and their act of defiance is perhaps the first recorded act of civil disobedience. These two sisters, two women who were background characters, meant to be extras in the story, put themselves at great peril and disobeyed Pharaoh's order because Pharaoh's authority was in direct contradiction with God's moral authority. And so for these women, even though it meant getting fired, even though it could have meant being demoted, even though it could have meant going to the house, it amounted to irreconcilable differences. And at great risk, they claimed their moral authority. When Pharaoh confronted them, they expressed to Pharaoh what is true about the women while calling out his privilege and prejudice. They said the Hebrew women are more vigorous and strong. They give birth before the midwives arrive. So even though they put their actions at risk, Shifra and Pua were in touch with their God-given vocation. Pharaoh didn't understand what he was asking these women to do because he was operating out of an imagined threat to Egyptian national security and self-preservation. But the midwives, somebody said the midwives, were operating out of a moral commitment. They remained true to their vocation of their calling. They understood that their calling was to be midwives rather than pallbearers. They understood that their primary vocation was to assist in bringing life rather
other than death. Scholars tell us that midwives in Israel were barren women. In a culture where having children and a family was the ordinary way to build a life, to gain respect, to know the blessings of God, these barren, possibly barren, somewhat marginal women found their place in community by helping other women bring forth new life. Their daily work, their daily routine, what they woke up to do in the morning was to help bring new life into the world. And is that not what midwives do? They don't just stand on the sidelines. They show up, they attend, they listen, they encourage as they coach and they stay as long as they are needed. They roll up their sleeves and they get involved in bringing forth new life into the world. And when they do so, they are exposed to all sorts of things, still births, painful births, poverty, pain, cruelty, suffering, compassion, joy, heroism, and injustice. And I dare say this morning that as we gather in this chapel service here at Christian Theological Seminary that we have the same opportunity. You see, you don't have to work in the delivery room to qualify as a midwife. You don't even have to go to medical school to be a midwife. You don't have to necessarily know nursing terms to be this kind of midwife. You see, when we act as a midwife, we roll up our sleeves and we get involved in bringing new life into the world. When we act as a midwife, we step off the sidelines and we enter into the thick and the joy and the pain of the world. When we see something happening that is unjust, when we speak up, we're acting like a midwife. Every time we tutor a child, whenever we address literacy to help students qualify for college exams, we're acting like a midwife. When we mentor teenage boys and girls, we're acting as midwives. When we host workshops, when we address domestic violence, we're acting as a midwife. When we address hunger and HIV and AIDS, we're acting as midwives. Whenever we adjust, so, address social injustices, inequality, voter information, voter fraud, and voter registration, we're acting as a midwife. When we host die-ins and hold up signs that say Black Lives Matter, we're acting as a midwife. When we assist the poor and the underrepresented, when we provide access to food and clothing and shelter and job opportunities, we're acting as a midwife. When we choose to speak up when other folks shut up, when we stand up when other folks sit down, we're acting as a midwife. When we take our voices to the street and lift up our voices in protest, we're acting as a midwife. Whenever we look into the eyes of those who are considered expendable and we see a life worth saving, we are acting as a midwife. When we act as our brother and sister's keeper, not just in word and in deed, we are acting as midwives. Thank God for a history that reminds us of the midwives, not necessarily in gender, but the males and the females who brought life to our lives, who brought life to women and men around the world in times of racial, economic, and gender equality. Thank God for the midwives. Thank God for freedom bureaus. Thank God for historically backed colleges and universities. Thank God for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Thank God for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Thank God for Rainbow Push, People United to Save Humanity. Thank God for the SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Thank God for the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Thank God for the Civil Rights Movement. Thank God for Black Fraternities. Thank God for Delta Sigma Theta and AKA and Alpha Phi Alpha and Kappa Alpha Psi. Thank God for Greek letter organizations and other agencies and seminaries that were committed to the uplift of other human beings. Thank God for midwives who were called to political and social action. Those who pooled their collective strength to promote equality. Thank God for the Osceola McCarthy's of the world. Thank God for those who did not regard it robbery to help us when we couldn't help ourselves. Matter of fact, you ought to stop right now and tell God thank you for every midwife. You ought to thank you for every coach, every teacher, every, every librarian, every cafeteria manager. You ought to thank God for the midwife.
midwives. I said, you ought to thank God. You ought to thank God for the midwives who would not shut up, who would not, who would step up, who would not keep silent in the face of oppression and suppression, but who marched in suffrage marches, who marched on state capitals, who marched on Edmund Pettus Bridge. Thank God for the midwives who marched in Memphis to bring dignity to sanitation workers. Thank God for midwives who used their power to advance, to resist the advancement of evil discrimination and oppression. Thank God for midwives who possess an uncompromising commitment to participate in God's liberating work. And here's the reason why we ought to thank God for midwives. I wish I was at church because if I was at church I'd tell you to yank your neighbor by the hand and tell him thank God for midwives. This is why you ought to thank God for midwives. The reason why you ought to thank God for midwives is because Pharaoh ain't dead. I said, you ought to tell somebody Pharaoh ain't dead. You see, Pharaoh is not a person. Pharaoh is an institution. Pharaoh is a slave master. Pharaoh is anybody that stands in the way of our high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I've come to announce today in this chapel service that there are so many equations that compete to shape our behavior as a society, as women and men, as professionals, and yes, even as scholars and pastors and preachers and people of faith. And if we're not careful, we can become vulnerable and complicit and susceptible to pressures that conform us to wrong values, to give in to power that is used for destructive rather than evil purposes. If we're not careful, we will become complicit in living lies and denying our calling. Rather than being helpers, we'll turn into herders because power told us to do so. Oh, but when you fear God, I wish I had somebody in here. I said, when you fear God, you know that he still works in mysterious ways. He still works through the hands of midwives. We serve the God who still sees and hears the cries of babies in baskets. We serve the God who still sees and hears the cries of the marginalized and the oppressed. We serve a God who still hears the cries of at-risk children. We serve a God who still hears the cries of heartbroken mothers who grieve the loss of sons and daughters. We still serve a God who still hears the cries of the unemployed and the invisible. And we still believe that we serve a God who moves in mysterious ways, who works through the secretive ways of prostitutes, who hide Jewish spies, the unexpected faithfulness of foreigners like Ruth, the riskiness of Mary, the handmaid of the Lord, and courage of midwives. And I need to tell you today that it is because of their courage that an entire narrative for a nation was changed. Because if the Hebrew midwives had not said no, Moses could have never said yes. And the Exodus story would have been different. And even though Moses and Isaac and Joshua and Caleb get top billing in scripture, if the entire book of Exodus hinges on what the midwives did. So why don't you clap your hands and tell God thank you for the midwives. Come on and thank him for Shipra and Pure. Come on and thank him for Margaret. Come on and thank him for, for Fannie Lou Hamer. Come on and thank him for Mary McLeod Bethune. Come on and thank him for Miriam and Esther. Come on and thank him for Sojourner Truth. Come on, thank him for Betty Shabazz. Come on, thank him for Barbara Jordan. Come on, thank him for Martin Luther King. Come on, thank him for Malcolm X and Mandela and Boozak and Frank Thomas and Jeremiah Wright and Christian Theological Seminary, open your mouth and tell God, thank you for the midwives. Because our narrative is different. Because somebody told Pharaoh no so that Moses could tell God yes. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You ought to praise him. You ought to give him glory. You ought to clap your hands, all ye people, and shout to God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord our God is a great God and a great king above all gods.